Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Our sermon text for this morning is a special text that's been selected for this Independence Day. Since July 4th landed on a Sunday this year, I thought it appropriate for us to consider a text that really focuses on our nation or the nation in which we live and how we as Christians should live under a earthly government. Let's consider our text for this morning in Jeremiah chapter 29, beginning at verse 4. The Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says this to all the exiles whom I have deported from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Get married and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there and do not decrease in number. Seek the peace of the city where I have exiled you. Pray to the Lord for that city, because when it has peace and prosperity, you will have peace and prosperity. The Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says this, Do not let the prophets and fortune tellers who are among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams they dream for you, for they prophesy falsely in my name. But I did not send them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. After seventy years have passed in Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious word to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to give you peace, not disaster. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come to pray to me, and I will listen to you. When you seek me, you will find me. And when you will seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from your exile. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have sent you as exile, declares the Lord. I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Lord, these are your words, and therefore they are your truth. We ask that you'd increase our faith through them. Amen. Dear fellow redeemed, do you love your country? Should you love your country. Over the past few years, we've probably noticed a, a number of protests and displays of protest against our country's national anthem, or against our Pledge of Allegiance, or against our nation's flag. Certain individuals in our country have been outraged by this. Why would anybody so show such lack of love and disrespect for this nation in which we live? Those people who protest, though, they say that it's not out of lack of love for our country or because they hate our country that they do these things, but they simply want to point out various injustices that have occurred, many at the hands of the government itself or those who enforce its laws. Whether you agree with those protesters or not, and whether or not you agree with the way in which they make a statement, I think all of us can recognize the faults and failures, the shortcomings of our own country. Which begs the question, should we as Christians love our country? Should we do so, especially not only knowing of injustices that have occurred, but also knowing the way in which our country at times has approved of actions that are contrary to God and his word? approved of immorality, legalized things like abortion and, and gay marriage? Should we as, as Christians support such a country or love such a country? It is true, our country is not perfect, but no country is. Every country has its faults and failings. Every country has its injustices. Every country does things at times that are contrary to God and his word. But perhaps that's a good reminder for us of this truth, that we are but foreigners and sojourners in this land. With the hymn writer, we too declare, I'm but a stranger here, heaven is my home. And yet knowing that, we ask the question, how should we live in this land where God has placed us right now? Well, God gives us encouragement in his word for us today as he can, encourages us to seek peace. Seek peace in the land where he has placed you. Seek that peace because it means earthly peace to some degree, 
and seek that peace knowing that your God gives eternal peace. I recognize that it's not a perfect comparison between us here today and the children of Israel who are hauled away into captivity in Babylon, but I think there's really much that we can learn from God's instruction to them as they lived as strangers and foreigners in that land. Certainly if anybody had reason for a grievance, anybody had reason to protest or act out in violence against their government, it was those people of Judah, the children of Israel, God's people that had been hauled away into captivity. After all, this foreign nation had carried out such acts of violence against them and against their country, destroying their land, destroying their cities, bringing them back into captivity to a strange place. And now they'd have to live under these oppressors? It seems strange to us what God says. But what does he instruct them even when these situations aren't quite ideal? He says, build houses and settle in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Get married and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there and do not decrease in number. As even though the government wasn't perfect, even though they lived under a heathen nation and its rule, God instructs them, live life. Build houses and dwell in them. He encourages them to even plant fields or plant gardens, enjoy their bounty, enjoy their fruit. He instructs them to dwell in the land. He instructs them even to prosper in the land so that their families might be provided for. But he also instructs them, continue to marry and give into marriage. Continue to have kids. And interestingly enough, he tells them, don't stop having kids. And you've probably heard many times people say, why in the world would I ever want to have a child? Or why in the world would I ever want to have another child and bring that child into this world that's filled with so much sorrow and suffering and pain? That, of course, was true for these people taken away into captivity. Yet God encourages them, keep having kids. And the reason was, is he didn't want his people to die out from the earth. He wanted his people to still be a witness to the nations. That his people might still be salt and light in this world that's filled with so much darkness and so much blandness on account of sin. God encourages us the same today as well. But God goes further as he tells them, Seek peace. Seek peace in the city in which you dwell. He even encourages them to pray for its peace and prosperity. That seems mind-boggling to us. It doesn't it almost seem cruel of God that they would pray for the peace of their oppressors? What is God doing? Encouraging some sort of Stockholm syndrome in, in which the, captors fall, the, cap, the captives fall in love with their captors? By no means. God understands. He understands what will happen if they rise up against this earthly government. Even though they maybe say they have many grievances, it's really not going to turn out well for them. He knows that it's only going to mean further violence and lack of prosperity. And so he encourages them, seek the peace of that nation and that city under which they dwell even if it's not perfect, because their peace means your peace too. God encourages us in the same today to seek peace in this land, to pray for peace and prosperity in this nation. And it's by no means perfect, isn't it? There's many injustices that incurred, many, many rulers that should be thrown out of office, many leaders that aren't maybe the best fit for us in our land. God encourages us, don't overthrow the government, don't act out in violence, but instead pray for peace. Because our country's peace means peace for us too. You know, God really explains the role of earthly government in Romans chapter 13. As he really explains that God himself is the one who established government. And he gives it for a very good purpose. In Romans chapter 13, the Apostle Paul writes, The government is God's servant for your benefit, 
for your blessing. We have earthly government, despite its faults and failures, for our benefit, for our blessing. But he goes on. If you do wrong, be afraid, because he does not carry the sword without reason. He is God's servant, a punisher, to bring wrath on the wrongdoer. As God gives us the blessing of earthly government for this chief purpose, in order to preserve peace and prosperity in society. What would happen if we were terrified of our neighbor? Terrified that our neighbor would at any moment come in and steal our stuff and kill us or disrupt our place of business. That certainly wouldn't mean much peace for us or prosperity for us. How good it is for government in order to, to punish evil to punish criminals, to hold them accountable for the wrongs that they have done, and at times even use capital punishment. Certainly that strikes fear and terror into the hearts of those who do evil, but it does, to some degree, also mean peace and prosperity. It means that we can live in a land with order and, and civility, that we can live out our lives in that same peace and prosperity. But God wants his people not just to seek peace in their nation because it's going to mean some level of earthly peace for them here on earth, but also he wants to point them forward to the true peace that he gives every one of us. Now when God had hauled away the children of Israel into captivity, the real reason that they were taken away wasn't really because of the Babylonians. It wasn't even really because of God desiring this for them. It was really because of his people's own sin and their own immorality and their own unfaithfulness. You see, God had blessed the children of Israel in countless ways. He'd given them a land. He'd given them wonderful freedoms. He'd given them even gracious rulers such as David and Solomon and how they prospered even under those kings. And yet, during that prosperity, what did they do? They ended up forgetting about the one true God who gave all of that to them. They ended up turning aside to false gods and false religions. They ended up turning aside to the immorality of the heathen nations around them. This was the reason why God led them into captivity. It was ultimately because of them and because of their own unfaithfulness and their own sin that God allowed this, because God wanted to give them a wake-up call that they might return to him again. You know, I wonder if sometimes we ourselves take for granted the amazing country in which God has placed us. We take for granted the wealth of freedoms that we enjoy and the tremendous prosperity. It'd be hard to argue that there'd be a better country in which to live in this entire world because of our freedoms, because of the prosperity that we enjoy. And yet we can take for granted the giver of all those good things. We can forget that God is the source. And the result can be that we don't worry so much about God. We don't concern ourselves with him and with his word. It can be so easy to fall in line with the ways of the sin-filled world, can't it? The ways of the world is certainly attractive to us. It's certainly attractive to our sinful flesh. But God at times allows hardship. He allows difficulty. He allows suffering in our life. Maybe as a way to wake us up, to remind us of who he is, the amazing benefits that he has given us, to remind us of our need for him. You know, I think that there's some times in which we can say, well, our, our country isn't perfect, and the reason for that is, well, we, we just haven't found the right form of government, or we just haven't uh, elected the right leaders. Or if our, our citizens would just be a little bit better. And the reality is, as much as we strive for those things in this world, as much as we strive for a, a sort of utopian nation, it's never going to happen, is it? The reason it isn't going to happen is because our world is filled with sinful people. And not just sinful 
rulers and leaders, not just sinful police officers and others who carry out the laws of our land, but it's filled with sinful people like you and me. So often we want to point the finger at everyone else that it's the government's fault or it's these outward oppressors that are making our life so terrible, but if we really look closely at the sufferings we endure so often, it doesn't usually come from external forces, but the things we suffer from chiefly are on account of our own sin. It's important for us to realize that, to realize our own sinfulness and the ways in which we have gone against God and his word. And yet that same God gives amazing hope to his people today. As he declares to them, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to give you peace, not disaster. Plans to give you hope in a future. Despite, despite their sinfulness, despite their ingratitude, despite their unfaithfulness to God, he has plans for them. Plans to give his people hope and a future not because they have been so good, but because he is gracious and merciful. And God foretells that he's going to return his people after a time. Yeah, they're going to suffer for a time in the land of Babylon, but he's going to bring them back to the land of Israel. And they had reason to rejoice in that, reason to have hope, not simply because they'd be back in their land to be able to rule over themselves, to enjoy a familiar location, but especially because of God's promise connected to that land. Think of the promise so clearly stated in Micah 5. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old from ancient times. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and he will be our peace. It's an awesome promise of God, an awesome promise that he tied to the land of Israel. It was in Bethlehem, Ephrathah, in the land of Judah. That's where the Messiah was to be born. And so he's bringing his people back to the land so the Messiah could be born there. The Messiah that would be the perfect ruler, the perfect shepherd for his people. That would ultimately bring them peace. We know who that is, don't we? It's our Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the one that God sent for us. And because of our sin, our sin that, that caused there to be a disruption, caused there to be hatred between us and God, God sent his son Jesus Christ in this world to fix the problem of our sin and to enact true peace. Not simply peace here on this earth, but peace forever with him in eternity. And he did it in a most remarkable way. You know, so oftentimes when there's two nations that are warring against each other, the way in which they, they finally sign a peace treaty is one nation shows its power and authority over the other. Shows that it has great weapons or great strength or it's maybe decimated the other country. And, and finally, the weaker country has to sign and say, yes, okay, we will have peace. But this peace was enacted in a very different way. Instead of showing us completely our, our weakness and our failures and forcing us to somehow give to him something. God gave what was necessary to bring about true peace between us and God. God gave the sacrifice that would establish a peace treaty between us and him. And his son, Jesus Christ. That son who ultimately went to the cross for us willingly. He suffered and died there knowing that that suffering and death would mean that our sins would be totally washed away and make us right with God, the one that we had rebelled against. Furthermore, God ultimately is pointing his people and he's pointing us not just to Christ but to the eternal land of rest and peace that he gives us in him. Just as the children of Israel, God wants us to realize that this world is not perfect. He wants to look forward to the peace that he gives us forever in the mansions of heaven. And so as we live in so, as sojourners in this life, as foreigners in this land, as we recognize all of its imperfections and all of its injustices, we ask that question, how would God have us live here? 
God doesn't demand that we show every sort of love for our country, but he does command us to respect it. He commands us to respect its laws. He commands us as well to seek peace in this land in which we dwell, to pray for peace and prosperity, but especially look for peace not merely here on this earth, but look forward to the peace that he has prepared for us forever in heaven through his son, Jesus Christ. That's the wonderful peace that God has prepared for all of us in him. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be forevermore. Amen.